last couple of days, and it's been extremely empowering for many of us. Uh, it's been enlightening, it's been very grounding. The welcome to country by Uncle Wally, as everyone has mentioned, was so profound. Um, and I will never look at another tree on campus in the same way again. And I'm also ashamed that I'm a product of the ANU, someone who did my PhD here, and someone who's worked here for 13 years. And I did actually used to touch the trees when I would walk through campus, but I didn't know what he told us um, on the Monday morning. So as a, as a indigenous Banaban person, I'm always aware of land, I'm always aware of trees, particularly because they're very precious on my island, so I pay attention to them, but what he gave us on Monday was a kind of a grounding that I could have never have imagined. So that has caused me to imagine teaching Pacific Studies in a completely different way from here on in at ANU. So thank you again for the panel earlier. That was incredible. That was profound. That was extremely generous of everyone. And I'm also glad the theme of uh, collective care and well-being was woven so powerfully through that panel because that is something that we've been focusing on and talking about throughout this whole um, experience, amazing experience we're having with each other. Um, so to, uh, for the next panel on decolonizing teaching and research, we have three amazing scholars, um, artists uh, with us. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is allow you to introduce yourselves in the way that you want uh, people to, to know you uh, and your work. And they're going to share a few stories about what led them into a particular decolonial method or approach or um, inspired them to do things a bit differently, whether in the research context or in the classroom. So. We'll start with Natalie. Thank you so much, Katarina. And always, um, we've been saying all week, thank, it's been an incredible few days with you and we have been hosted so warmly. Um, yeah, it's just been like a massive, big nurturing hug, um, <laughs> which some of us have really needed <laughs> deeply. So thank you so much. Um, and also just to echo um, what so many people have said about um, I'm Wally welcoming us to country. It was, and I acknowledge, I acknowledge uh, Wally, I acknowledge um, his ancestors and the elders past, present, future on this country. Um, to know the names of the, the mountains that surround us, to walk um, through the campus with him, we took it very gently, very slowly, and to be with those canoe trees, um, scar trees was yeah, incredibly beautiful. Um, and as you said, grounding and um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what else to say. It was, it was, we had this power surge as a group, I think, of really uh, being grounded but also energised. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I am an Arunga woman from South Australia. I have um, connections to, I guess, many groups and families, but my, fam my, my family, from, uh, the Chester family from Point Pierce Mission. Um, I have a three mission history which is very typical of Aboriginal people in South Australia so we were forcibly moved from lands from the west coast of South Australia um, and also um, family from Noongar country as well who were forcibly moved to the Penindi mission um, north of Port Lincoln on Nao country um, and then um, as that mission was winding up, um, it was actually an incredibly economic viable mission for the community there who were farming, who were doing incredible work um, as a community becoming <coughs> economically viable. Um, it wasn't really the agenda of the state for that to happen. They closed down that mission and our families were then moved to another mission um, by a steamboat. Um, to uh, what was called Point Maclay in the heart of the Kurong, uh, Malindjeri country, <coughs> and uh, is now Raukin, the heart of the Kurong. So um, I have family from there who were born there, um, into marriage from there, and uh, also my family uh, were then moved to Point Pierce Mission when Raukin, uh, Point Maclay Mission became too crowded 
So our families were then forcibly moved to another Mission Point Pierce. So ancestrally, we have connections with lots of bits of South Australia. I call Narunga country home because that's where my nana was born and who she, she called home. It was home to her. It was where all her family <coughs> were, despite being missionised and being under the control of the state for every, your every single move from the, the bell that would wake you up, the bell that would send you to school, the mission bell that would tell you when to go to lunch, the mission bell to tell you the end of school, the mission bell to tell you to go to sleep, the mission bell to tell you to go to church, um, etc. So they were managed, controlled, surveilled, contained in a mission. Nevertheless, she called that place home. She loved it because she was with her family. She was surrounded by her family, her grandparents who raised her, her aunties, cousins, uncles. Um, that was home. Um, I'm a poet and I bring poetry into my, um, my teaching and my research. And um, I work with the Unbound Collective with Ali, Simone and Faye. And it is a true honour and a gift. I'm so glad you're here today. You actually make me feel stronger <laughs> to speak strong in a space which has been incredibly violent but also incredibly rewarding and um, yeah I love what I do but it can also be very difficult. Thank you. Um, um, also an acknowledgement uh, of the, the people of this place. Um, the, you've heard us all have a little rave about the amazingness of Uncle Wally and the, 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 the Tukura campus. I think one of the things that that walk did, um, the, the quite profound practical dimension of a welcome to country being about getting to actually walk on country and see country is that we got to see ANU and I'm not a product of ANU, I've been here for a couple of conferences that have been very nice but um, I, you know, I don't have a connection with the campus but I think in many ways this is a reflection of what we've been talking about over the last three days is what are, what are the ways that we can see all of our respective institutions, how can we see the academy um, with different eyes and what are the people that if we can sidle up to them and they can help us see them with those eyes, um, I think we get to then think differently about the things that we already saw before we saw those things, if that makes sense. So it's that kind of revisioning, I think, um, that real, like, like the really tangible, practical reminders of ongoing Indigenous, specific Indigenous presence everywhere we are. Um, I'm from Te Ao Te Ao and Taranaki. Um, so we are the, yay, <laughs> from the, the, the west, unfortunately, due to some uh, 200 years ago activity between northern Maldives and uh, Sydney, um, some muskets pushed us south, um, and so for about 200 years now, my, um, my tribal groups have been the local people in Wellington, um, so when Europeans first got to Wellington, it was um, us that they met there, um, and so I'm one of those people who's urban Māori both ways. Um, I've grown up in cities, but also my, my own uh, tribal uh, land is covered in concrete and buildings. Mm -hmm. um, which is why, um, oh no, it fell off, that's right. There's a, there's a picture that I've got of um, a view from Machu Sounds, which is an island in the middle of the Wellington Harbour, um, which is one of those kind of, that's right, it's one of those kind of rare, rare places from which you can still, you know, vision, you know, our place, um, the way that it kind of, you know, continues to be. Um, I currently teach in the Faculty of Māori and Indigenous Studies at the University of Waikato. Um, I have taught in Indigenous Studies um, uh, at home now for a couple of years um, and also here in Australia. Um, I've also taught in Aboriginal Studies in Canada um, and I've taught in English and Pacific Studies in, uh, at, at home on my own whenua at Victoria University of Wellington where Emilani now is um, holding the fire. Um, and also at the University of Hawaii, and I, I say all that stuff, I, and I did my PhD in English and American Indian Studies um, on Cougar um, Territory, which is in upstate New York. Um, 
I say those things not to break about the number of air miles that I have, <laughs> an embarrassing number, which our discussions about you know, uh, uh, well-being are making me reflect on the 22 flights that I've taken this year. Mm. Um, but um, I say that because I've spent most of my academic career being on other people's land, um, being a guest um, of other indigenous people, um, and so my research and teaching is certainly informed by that. Um, I understand who I am, I know where I come from, but I spend most of my time actually not being the voice of the person from that place. Um, and so I guess that's part of the, the, the thing that has shaped how I understand myself as an Indigenous scholar and also the work um, and the kuleana, the, the, the obligations and responsibilities that I have as a scholar. Mm. Did it oh, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh. I really don't want to interrupt you, but I just had to say it's my small two-year-old who is running around oh. making noise, <laughs> and I would like to thank everyone for their patience and oh happiness. Oh she <laughs> joy of having a child to annoy everybody all day. So I'm really sorry <laughs> if she drives everyone, you know, makes no. everyone excited. No. <laughs> no. I did just want to thank everybody for their. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not apologising, but I'm thanking everyone for your in advance for your patience. Debbie, <laughs> <laughs> Dean, um, good morning, everyone. I, I want to begin by acknowledging Ngunnawal the the country and pay my respects to the elders of this country, and also bring Uncle Wally back into the room again. He's so he's everywhere here with us today. Um, I found his introduction to ANU as an Aboriginal place. Um, fantastic for a Torres Strait woman, a Dara woman with family connections to Murray Island, Dawara in particular, um, and connections to the west of Badu and Mabiok. I, like so many people, um, am a visitor of this country. Um, and I want, to, um, I want to acknowledge the support that I get also from an Indigenous person, from the Indigenous women um, who've been part of this program this week and thank you Kati for, for having me here. Um, so I'm um, a postdoc in history at the University of Sydney. Um, my work has been, oh gosh, probably for the last 12 years my work has been totally on Torres Strait um, history, Torres Strait histories of labour um, and Torres Strait material culture. I've worked with Aboriginal communities since I graduated in the 80s and worked with um, and worked with elders who are traditional owners of Carnarvon Gorge and worked with elders from the War of Inda, the War of Inda Mission. Um, where I was in my 20s schooled on um, how to be respectful of place and people um, and to and I suppose to know how to look after myself in places that are culturally powerful. Um, spiritually powerful, yeah. um, but also places that were sites of massacre, mm. um, which and um, we know they are all over this country. Mm -hmm. So, um, what else can I tell you? I'm going to leave it there, I think. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so, what I thought we could do on this panel is you know, each of our um, Amazing Scholars has a particular story that um, we discussed that they could share with people um, that I think two of them come from the archival context and one of them comes from the museum context, but it was kind of a, an aha moment for them in terms of the kind of research that they were gonna do or what they were gonna do with the information that they found um, in the archives or the story or experience that they were having in the classroom. So, um, who would like to go first? Do you want to? Um, we have a story of a mask. We have a story of something that happens in the classroom, and then we have a story from I'm, the archives. I have to start. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I pull up your. Yeah, sure. Um, so my story, um, I suppose, relates to my PhD research, yeah. which was on Torres Strait Torres masks, mm -hmm. and. So I suppose in thinking about the question that, that our group kind of were posed with, thinking about what having a decolonizing, so for me, thinking about what, what does having a decolonizing approach mean for my research practice and by extension my teaching practice, but I'm kind of going to focus a lot more on my research practice. So my PhD work was on Torres Strait total masks, 
Um, Torres Strait people are the only people who make these huge three-dimensional masks that reference um, people, but also reference totemic animals. Um, the first mask, the first not European, known European sighting of a mask in the Torres Strait was on the central island of Zege in 1606. So people in that region have been making these things for a very long time. Um, the first time I saw a mask, I was a backpacker. I was in London. Um, it was in the British Museum. I was in my 20s. Um, when I submitted my dissertation on Tomashar masks, it was almost 30 years after seeing that first mask, mm. which for me is a really important thing about um, maturity um, and being in, a, being in a time, I suppose, in a place where I could do the kind of research I needed to do to give I can't even say justice, but to honour, mm. to honour the masks and to honour the ancestors that are associated with the masks. Um, so I have a quick story about this mask, which was, um, so you'll see, so it's, it, cur it currently lives in the, uh, in the National Museum of Denmark, um, but it was stolen from its, um, it was stolen from its keeping place in the central Torres Strait in 1836. By Captain Charles Lewis, he was on the Isabella. He was looking for um, two survivors of a shipwreck, um, the Charles Eaton that shipwrecked, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, just off the coast of Queensland in 1834. Um, so when Lewis eventually found this mask on Arid in the central Torres Strait, um, no people, islanders had fled. No people were on the island when he and his crew landed on the island and discovered this mask, discovered this mask down the end of a grove of coconut trees, um, a path lined by shells. Um, he opened the door and saw this mask. It stands about 95 centimetres high. On it were some of the things that he thought, well, some of the thing, what he thought were some of the skulls that he was looking for. So on this mask, when it was initially found, were 40 to 45 human skulls. Mm. Some of them were of Europeans. And later on, um, later on, there's people who, go, who look at them and decide that 17 of them were of European origin. But a lot of them weren't, so the rest of them weren't. This is, so, and they were very old, because they were so that's thing. So anyway, they, um, they take the roof off this hut that the mask was kept in and remove it. Um, and while some of the men take the mask back to the ship, um, Lewis and his crew decimate the entire island. Mm. Um, dig up the plants, burn the trees, everything, everything is decimated. And then they leave and Lewis names the island Skull Island. Mm. So there's this, there's this kind of interesting thing about um, islanders taking skulls and keeping skulls and using skulls, but also white people who came there and looking for skulls as well, taking skulls. So there's, there's this kind of interesting, uh, mutual interest in skulls. So anyway, the... the <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, the mask ends up in Sydney, where the, uh, and in the Australian Museum, the skulls are removed. Um, I, and the trail kind of goes cold because um, on a tombstone, 17 of the skulls are said, that were said to be European were buried, but I don't know what happened to the others. Mm -hmm. so, so there are all these things that, that happen to some things and not to others say something about that kind of colonial um, attitude and the way things were thought about treated. Um, <clears throat> uh, so what else happens? So towards the end of my um, research period, I spent a bit of time in the New South Wales State Archives and find um, almost 10 years after Lewis stole this mask, I find um, a petition from his wife. And I'll read it out to you. Please. So she petitions the then governor, Governor Gibbs. Um, and, and, it, and it says, and she says this, so this is in 1843. Your petitioner's husband went insane in his mind, and consequently, in the state of depression of spirits, he took shipping and went to England without my knowledge. <laughs> I thought, oh my God. <laughs> like, really? 
<laughs> of course he went mad. Mm. Um, so and I don't. So there is a phrase that was repeated a lot during the um, the um, Uncle Koiki Mabo and others made a title case. Tag maki maki te te maki maki. Yeah, you, you people will know it. So tag is hand, te te is feet. So your hand does not take or touch the things that don't belong to you. Mm. And you don't, and your feet don't kind of move across the land that isn't yours, unless of course you've had a welcome to this place by Uncle Molly. <laughs> um, and I thought, when I, saw, I sat there in the archive and thought, Eureka, of course. This to me is evidence of um, under spiritual practices and work. Mm -hmm. This is what happens if people touch the stuff that is not theirs. Mm -hmm. And we're told all the time as kids, no, 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 that's not, that's not for you. You can't go there. That's not for you to take. That's not for you to touch. Um, so, and it's these things that I think, for me, contribute to the way I want to bring out um, islander knowledges and practices and ways of, and ways of understanding and being in the world. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> yes, of course he went mad. We've got a little gem to find in the archives, and I think the three of us are so passionate, like so many in the room, um, about what the archive, the colonial archive, can, um, can offer what it can do, but also what we can do to it and with it um, to decolonise it um, from our standpoint. So um, I guess that brings me to um, my research interest. I think from probably the early 1990s, I started um, getting interested in some of our family story that was documented on the state Aboriginal records. Mm. And I did that with my family, with my cousins and with my nana. And, um, and that led us then to, after the Bringing Them Home report and that national inquiry into the forcible removal of children from their families, of which we have um, three generations of removal, despite knowing all our family and who they are in that story, there were lots of unanswered uh, questions we had in our story about what that, you know, why would my nana be taken from a community that loved and adored her? Um, her mother was a domestic, uh, white <coughs> establishment, Adelaide establishment families, as, average, as many Aboriginal women were. Um, but she managed to get back to her mother, but then was taken into and institutionalised under the children's welfare then, and also had access to and from um, her mum and, and all her siblings. But it, it's just what happened. It's, it was the like when I talk to, talk about my story, my family story to students. Some of them say, "Well." Was she a spy? Like, was she, was she, what was going on with her? It's like, no, actually, this was the assimilation policy that affected every Aboriginal family that I know across Australia. So, as, and some key assimilation measures were targeting girls in particular and women for removal, because most of the children that were removed were girls, um, and then to be trained as. Um, uh, in, in the domestic sciences as to be domestics and for domestic servitude, often for indentured labour. So my nana was like, well, my mum was working. Um, I was with a family and community who loved me. Why was I removed and institutionalised? She just, she just had that one question. So we knew who we were, but we went into link up, we got our records, and what she thought she was coming back was with a story just on her own, you know, some a little bit of information maybe on her own mum was an incredibly thick file on her, a surveillance file, that she had absolutely no idea existed. She was 72 years old. She shredded some of it, and she threw the rest of it in the bottom of her wardrobe. And I've written about this, and she, we've talked a lot about this within our family as well. Um, and, and it was quite, you know, this harrowing an, a response to some of the ways that she was represented, her mother was represented, her family was represented, but also the privileging of all of these um, archons of state that controlled her, 
the matrons, the superintendents, the police, the psychologist report, the teachers, the protector, the subprotector, and the list goes on. And they're all their their signatures are there, very clearly signing off on her life. Um, but what was most beautiful in these records that she did not know of was these a whole selection of letters from her mother mm. to her, or not, not not directly to her, to the state, mm. and letters that she had written um, to the to the various um, people who control her life. Um, and they were incredibly, they were incredible letters to find when you had no idea that they were written or that they were kept if you were the writer of those letters. So um, there are other letter projects which I find incredible, one of them being the Lungar Letter Project, and she you know has um, been involved with this and uh, led by Elfie Shizaki, I think, and others um, in, um, out of the WA Cup. Western Australian archives and repatriating those letters back to families. Those letters show so much strength and agency and resilience of our women in particular, our men as well. I've got letters from my um, great grandfather as well, um, protesting against the lowering of the age of child removal, um, so back in the 1920s. So our families, what these archives re reveal to us um, is the incredible activism and agency of our families to fight for each other. So the state was the kind of the mediator. The Nana and um, my great grandmother never saw the, the letters that each of them wrote. They were all kept and filed. But nevertheless, what they show is that there's this incredible deep love. And what my Nana and all her siblings were charged with was of neglect and mm. being destitute. Mm. And that was their legal charge. Mm. So we can see this. We see this in these archives. They're incredible spaces for us to get into, disrupt, rupture, just rip it apart, mm. and really reveal the strength of our families despite all of that control and surveillance. Mm. Mm. So I knew I had to do something with these letters, and not just these letters, but all of the archives that I was collecting. I felt like I was actually losing myself. I was creating the very thing I was critiquing, which was the archive box. And I've written about a poem called Archive Box Transformation, and what that meant for me to transform out from those really violent sites, because it is the violence of the colonial archive that we're talking about. And whilst the archive is an incredible source for you know facts and we find some really important information that do fill the pieces of those gaps in our family story, or indeed the gaps in the larger narrative of our history of the nation, we need access to these archives. They need to be transparent. We need to make them accountable. We need to bear witness, not just ourselves, but all of us. Um, this is our shared story. So, uh, what's my train of thought? Out of the archive, getting in there to disrupt it. Um, <clears throat> so I had to do something with it to get out of this archive box that I was creating, and the only way for me really to move forward as a as a poet, closet poet, that then became a bit, a bit more public, um, was to write poetry in response because that was my natural. That's just what I've always done. And, um, and integrate that as a method of writing poetry and weaving um, a basket from those letters. So to try and do something a bit more transformative physically with the, the materiality of the archive, but also respond through text. And so I was told by my supervisor, you know, you're writing, you're a Victor critical writer, you're writing Victor criticism. And I was like, oh, what is that? I have no <laughs> idea what Victor critical writing is. It does not speak to me. But I thought, no, I need to, uh, why do I feel uncomfortable? What is it about Victor criticism as a method that makes me feel really uneasy? Like, um, and it's not that I'm, I'm against Victor criticism as a method. It just didn't fit with me. So I went, I, w I did creative non-fiction workshops. I went to a Victor critical writing masterclass at the University of Technology <laughs> Sydney, um, which was led by these Victor critical scholars. Um, with, I was surrounded by Victor critical writers who were wanting, you know, students and, and academics, and they were all so excited. And, 
and I was and I was just like I feel like an outsider and so what I did after that workshop um, and this was outside of my PhD methodology I just wanted to write to every Aboriginal writer I knew in Australia and say do you identify with Victor criticism what is do you have a method that you identify with um, I didn't build that into my thesis because it wasn't my research question it was just for me to get a sense of what is something for me um, that can be informed by my own cultural, culturally locally situated standpoint. So it felt it felt natural then to it just evolved very slowly. I call it a slow situated unfolding as a decolonial method and an activist method. Um, so archival poetics um, is is what I'm doing. Which is, yes, and there's the basket <coughs> letters. So it is a basket um, that's made. I've experimented with lots of paper. I wanted to replicate the feel and the translucency of the archive. So the yellowing, I actually was able to touch so many archives, and there's just mountains of them on, our, on my family alone, just gazillions of them, which I was able to see and, and touch and feel. And some of them were literally crumbling in my hand. So now there's a digitisation process, thankfully, to preserve um, the record. But I remember just sweeping, you know, they were so precious that I hated them at the same time. Like, it was the paradox of the archive. They were the records I really uh, loved and I hated, so I get very excited about archives, but they're also, I recognise, you have to go there. That's what we talk to students about. You need to go into those really dark, traumatic histories of our shared history of colonialism in order to do something with it, disrupt it, rupture, transform out of it in a really loving way, because this is a new archive for our families, for my children, this is, these are the artefacts, and with the Unbound Collective, we often say the work we're wanting to produce in disrupting the colonial archive and the institutions of power like museums <laughs> is that we want to. Um, <laughs> the lights I want to shed the light on the. <laughs> about research and teaching um, and um, uh, that, I, that I hope is hopeful. An Indigenous Woman Scholar's Prayer. May I grow old enough to be forgotten. May my questions become passe. May my bibliographies become outdated. May my theories be superseded. May I be obsolete. May I teach students who teach students who teach students. May I meet these younger thinkers at conferences. May I read and cite their work. May I watch them stand more stately than I could ever have dreamed. May I sit in committee meetings with young colleagues who have raised new challenges because the old ones have finally been put to rest. May I watch the old guard quietly move on. But more than this, may I live long enough to be part of an old guard who younger scholars wish would retire. <laughs> <laughs> may I get to retire. May I see scores of Indigenous scholars write hundreds of Indigenous books that ask thousands. May I meet Indigenous Vice-Chancellors, Presidents, Professors and Deans. May they not all be me. <laughs> <laughs> May I lie on a future deathbed and look back with regrets related to work rather than regrets related to family. May my passing be unshocking, not early, not unexpected. May I run out of ideas before I run out 
don't mind if we could stay a bit longer um, past the time that we were um, we were hoping to finish at 12 but I feel like this panel is so important and the next panel is really really important um, so we might just um, do a little check with our colleagues and make sure we can stay here a bit longer for, for all of you who can I know some people might have to leave um, but I really 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 appreciate um, what you all shared. Um, and is there any uh, comment or question? Okay, maybe that's appropriate. Yeah. 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 So we're gonna move straight into the next panel. Thank you so much.